Hello, world singers. My name is Tyler. And I'm Brooke. And this is Cosmere Conversations. Conversations. got another episode for you today episode five we are looking at the 17th shard and the world hoppers in the cosmere last week's episode on hoid so much information <laughs> yeah. we started to dabble into the 17th yeah, shard. Yeah, as we have a few times. Um, so I feel like we've laid a really good groundwork, uh, and now we're going to get a little bit deeper into those people and organizations. Exactly. We didn't want it to become a three-hour episode of <laughs> yeah. Hoyt and the 17th shard, so we get two oh, episodes. This one, just looking at the 17th shard, which is kind of a... Uh, competing entity to Hoyd, or at least we talked about how they are after him. Yeah, well, I feel like, I mean, there's a reason Cosmere fans have sort of adopted the name of the 17th Shard, because I feel like they're like us, they recognize Hoyd and are like, hey man, you have info, like, let me follow you through the Cosmere, which is exactly what we're doing as fans. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) And we believe that the author of the second letter again referencing our episode last week but the second letter addressed to hoid possibly from a dragon the author has a a founding partnership or or at least a, a he's a founding member of the 17th shard it seems that way i mean he is at least familiar with them absolutely yeah actually why don't we just pick up right there from that letter um because hoyd's letter there is i think the first introduction we get to the term the 17th shard and that concept at all excellent in hoyd's letter he says i am being chased you're friends of the 17th shard i suspect i believe they're still lost following a false trail i left for them they'll be happier that way i doubt they have any inkling what to do with me should they actually catch me And while this letter written by Hoyd to, we believe, a dragon, is happening at the beginning chapters of uh, part two in The Way of Kings, and we also see what he's talking about, although I didn't know it at the time in my first read Oh, I did. Excellent. Good catch. Good catch. It follows the um, interlude of Ishik, the Pure Laker. And he is traveling through the Pure Lake, meets up with some, like, interesting characters that he comments, like, don't quite seem to be any of the ethnicities on Rashar, but that he's should, like, uh, maybe, and they all have weird accents. That should like, always be a hint. When yeah. someone is uh, described as not really belonging or doesn't really fit any traditional ethnic background or yeah. has a weird accent or yes. uses specific words that are not part of that uh, yeah. planet's mythology or, or uh, linguistic history, that is a big tip-off to those in the know that these people might be Could or be definitely world are yeah. world hoppers. That, the language thing is one of the things I love the most about it. I'm a big language nerd, so I really appreciate how Brandon has very specific linguistic characteristics for not only each book, but different um, ethnicities like on Rashar, things like that. And so if you have any kind of linguistic background or you're just a sharp reader, that makes it really easy and interesting to pick out those specific characters in other places. So we're on the Pure Lake, or we have we have a scene that is being referenced by Hoyt in that letter about these people who are chasing him from the 17th Shard. Who are those people? Like, who are the three people at the Pure Lake? Yeah, so at first, the only thing we know is that Ishik doesn't know their names. They don't give their names because um, they want to be anonymous. And... Uh, Ishik names them himself. So in his own head, he calls them Grump, the Thinker, and Blunt. Okay, so three people, Grump, Thinker, and Blunt, uh, just kind of given names that go along with their personalities. personalities. (laughs) And 
we know uh, as world singers that these individuals are more than meets the eye. Yeah, and I think most of it, I think, is able. You're able to deduce from the characters themselves in the story. I believe. But so. I think that all of them have also been confirmed by word of Brandon. So we know that Grump is actually Galadon from yep. Elantris. And I picked that one up because he does have that really specific linguistic pattern. Um, and he drops like a key word also that's a, a specific vocabulary word from Elantris. That exactly. you're like, oh hey! Yeah, Elantrian <laughs> lingo. Yeah. Then we have the thinker who is, now a little French pronunciation here, uh, is it Demo? Demoy? In fr- I always give it the French pronunciation, which sounds weird in English, but in French it would be Demou. Demou, right. Yeah. Okay, so Demou, and I believe, I'm not 100% certain about this, but I believe Brandon actually does have um, some French background. Oh, um, I'm not sure. Oh, I know he spent some time traveling in, I think, Korea. Did he do his mission there? Yeah, something yeah, yeah. like that, yeah. Yes. But I'm not sure about f- a French connection. <laughs> uh, I, I did think that I read something about him um, either working for a while or, or living for a while in France, but I, I could it be making It is the some traditional writer's uh, thing expatriate, to do. yeah. <laughs> oh, Brandon just pulling like some Hemingway Fitzgerald yeah, type of stuff. really going back to the roots. <laughs> Having my lost summer in Paris as I create an epic <laughs> fantasy <laughs> novel. Epic fantasy novel. Um. So we have the thinker who is Demu uh, from Mistborn, and he has a, a identifiable feature of the scar. Yeah. Now he always had that scar, right? He, no, he, he acquires it. it. Yeah, in within the Mistborn two. books. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that one I think is a little bit harder of a catch you have to really be paying attention Mm -hmm. but still like you can definitely pick that up just from reading the books like no Brandon Sanderson necessary absolutely and then Blunt this is the one that I did not pick up at all like I would not know this if Brandon didn't say anything but Blunt is supposed to be Baun I think that's how you say it Baon Baon yeah Baon Bound? I don't know. Um, from <laughs> White Sand, and he is like one of the bodyguards of Chris and White Sand. Yeah, and so I think that those three teaming up and going hunting for Hoyd is absolutely the scene that we, we see play out at the Pier Lake in Way of Kings. And you mentioned. Chris. Yes. Let's dive into Chris because yeah. Chris is really Well, okay, let me just say one thing first. Sure. The one great thing that I think about this little trio of world hoppers is right off the bat you're seeing people from three different planets throughout the Cosmere, like all working together. So I don't know. I just thought that was cool. Yeah, absolutely. And just to help everybody out, we have Elantris, uh yeah, which is who is Cell, Cell the planet. Uh, we have Mistborn, Skadriel, yep. and then we have... Taldane. Taldane from with White, White Sand. Sand. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so, yes, those three planets are connected enough where these members from the 17th Shard are teaming up together. Yeah, and we'll talk in a little bit about how they possibly got connected. Nice, nice, <laughs> nice. Okay, but yeah, let's talk about Chris because she is our... Our hero, our sort of patron saint of Cosmere knowledge. <laughs> Absolutely, because Chris is a character that we've actually been exposed to since the very beginning. Every time... Yeah, whether you know it or not, you have read Chris. Exactly. Well, as long as you've read the Ars Arcanum at the end of each of True. Brandon's books. Which at first, like, I definitely did not realize was an in-world yes. knowledge base. I definitely thought it was just your average, you know, index at the end to yeah. help you sort of keep track. Because especially I, for me in Mistborn, I always forget which metals do what. Yeah, absolutely. So like, okay, stuff. great, this is like great. But when you actually read like pretty deeply, you start to get all these other hints that are dropped. And you're like, oh, 
wait. And the writer is like writing in the first person sometimes talking about what they learned on the planet. And then you're like, oh, dang, I had to like go back and read a bunch of that. Exactly. It's really significant if you like kind of blew over the Ars Arcanum in your first read through. Yeah, to go, go back, back and read and the and full thing. Yeah. Now, we know now that Chris is the author of every single one of those Ars Arcanum. Yep. And this actually introduces kind of another element of an unreliable narrator, or mm, at least a yes. possibility, because she is a scholar and she is learning about each of these places which means that she can and most likely is wrong about some things about at some, least. exactly or at the very least has incomplete knowledge so even when you read the ars arcanums she doesn't have all the answers and in some of those articles she even says like i'm not really sure why this is true but this mm -hmm. is what i've observed so yeah there's definitely that element of things could change what we think we know which is a theme of the cosmere that i really enjoy and we call her chris spelling K-H-R-I-S-S. -S. But what is her real name and title? Ooh, yeah. Her full name is Duchess Chrysala. And she is originally from the country of Ellis, which is on the dark side of the shard world, Taldane, which again is in White Sand. So White Sand, just quick note, they have two, or they have yeah. one son, right? But it's only, it like rotates at a specific way where one side is always in light, one side is always in dark. Scientifically, I believe this is called being tidally locked. There you go. Chris would have known that word. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, in reference, our moon uh, here back on Earth, um, our moon is tidally locked with Earth. So that's why we only oh, see one right. side yeah. of the moon. Um, that basically will happen on a long enough timeline to Earth. And for Taldane, it has already happened for that planet, is that only one side um, is facing the Earth throughout its entire revolution. And so you have day side and, and dark, dark side. side. Yeah. And uh, Chris, as well as many people, I believe, on that world, dark side is where people have to live and yeah. they can kind of visit day side. So she is from one of the major cities there she obviously duchess is a member of the royal family but there's people above her and people yes, below her yes and she's and, a world hopper she's exploring the entire cosmere for the point of research yeah and i think she has such i would be really interested to hear more of her story and white sand we learn a little bit about how she embarks upon this journey of scholarship um her late fiance Gelvedin had gone on this fact-finding mission just to learn more about the magic on their own planet, Taldane. Um, and that's just the little bit that we see of her in White Sand. But I think we can extrapolate from that, that she starts there and then takes this scholarly expedition even farther out into the Cosmere to learn about all of the magic systems and all of the worlds. And she's really the pioneer of that i think absolutely and in some respects this gives chris a similar role that a reader has of these cosmere books yeah. is that she's discovering the magic systems and, and kind of has that third person perspective of not being in the story right and so chris is kind of a reader and we talked last week about the meta aspects of hoid and i think there are some meta aspects to chris it's not anything that I've like seen a word of Brandon about or kind of have any knowledge it's just an idea that I have is like okay Hoyd is a character that kind of realized he was a character and became a full and complete uh, individual in that process of Brandon's creation and Chris is kind of like a reader exploring the cosmic <laughs> figuring things out I like that element, even if it's not true. Even if Brandon comes back, he's like, no, I'm, I'm not that weird. Uh, <laughs> like, I would still enjoy thinking about uh, things that way. It's got kind of like an Inception vibe of like, you're watching these characters, yeah. but something else kind of seems to be going on as well. So Chris is inspired by her husband. She eventually figures out how to um, world hop, and we'll, we'll get into the specifics of like the main ways to world hop. Yeah. Uh, but... 
what where where's another place that we see her in the flesh not just as an yeah. author of the Ars Arcanum it took us a long time to actually see her in person she's in white sand of course but then she also shows up for a very short little scene in Mistborn's secret history um Kelsier runs into Chris and one of her friends and fellow scholars Nas um, and we'll talk about him in a little bit. And Kelsier tells them about Drifter and about a conversation he had with them. And they don't really seem like they want to run into Hoyd, which I thought was really interesting. They, like, immediately pack up and are like, okay, we got to go if Hoyd's here. So I don't know what that's about. Yeah, it's, we said last, uh, or when we were talking about the trio from oh, yeah. the Pier Lake, that they're interested they're in trying finding to find Hoyd, yeah. But Chris, who, if we were to rank people in the 17th shard, she's going to be above Demo, uh, Demu, yeah. Demu and that trio. We don't even know. We don't know if she's necessarily a part of the 17th shard. They seem to have a lot of connections, but we don't know for sure. One of the things that Chris says to Kelsier in that meeting in Mistborn's Secret History is she says... After being asked uh, about other planets by Kelsier, she responds, quote, Other planets, she repeated gently, yes, there are dozens of them. Many are inhabited by people much like you or me. There is an original, shrouded and hidden somewhere in the Cosmere. I've yet to find it, but I have found stories. Ooh, so Yolen? Yes, I, that's exactly what I believe she's talking about there. Ooh, that's is interesting. that Yolen... Where we know that Hoyt is from and is most likely the setting of what is now going to be like the last right. book series, Dragonsteel, but Brandon wrote as his master's thesis. That's where the shattering of Adenalsium took place, or at least many of the events leading up to it took place. So she's. We had last week with Hoyt, the storyteller, and mm -hmm. I see Chris as the story collector. She is collecting these stories, and Hoyt is kind of out there telling the stories. Or, like, another way, I feel like Hoyt is kind of weaving a web of illusions, right? Like a light weaver, and just kind of layering them on, playing behind the scenes. Chris is trying to get behind the scenes, yes. right? She's, like, peeling the layers back, which is maybe what has led her to discovering the existence of Nolan, right? She, or Yolan, sorry. She was kind of tried to go back to the source. Absolutely. And the next place that we see Chris appear in the flesh is Mistborn Era 2. She is at that party uh, shortly after Wax interacts with Hoyd yep. as a beggar. <laughs> he then meets Chris. Such though. an auspicious party. <laughs> yeah, and this is this is what I, we were, have been talking about and mentioned so much. Once Brandon got to that point in his career when he was like, I'm Brandon Sanderson and I'm famous now, yeah. <laughs> um, he could write to his heart's content. Yeah. And that's where everything... Mistborn Era 2 has so much more. Yes. And, and it's amazing to see the pieces and then know that these pieces are going to become part of a puzzle that we can't even understand. Oh my gosh, yet. yeah. Like, we're pretty nerdy about it. But we still can't see what the full picture is going to be. Yeah. I've been reading the epigraphs from Words of Radiance, and there is so much in there that I'm like, I know that this is important, but, like, I cannot even begin to know why, <laughs> because there's so much. But, I'm sorry, go ahead, the party. Yeah, so Wax uh, is dancing with a woman, and another woman cuts in. The second woman is Chris, and she kind of approaches him in a very scholarly, scientific way. She's yeah. asking him questions. She asks him about, like, the physics of his powers, and she's like, so how does that actually work? Does it work this way with gravity, or are you doing this? And he's kind of like, uh, I'm not really sure. Yeah, but it's, like, do a it. very odd question for a party guest to be asking. Yeah, I mean, she asks a question, and I, I think I, I remember it specifically because it's actually a very illuminating uh, question she asks Wax, who has the ability to change his 
weight, I believe is the way that it's described. Uh, density is a, another way of thinking about it. But through Furukami, Wax is able to change his weight at will. And he also has the ability to uh, steel push, to push on any uh, metallic objects. And so what the question that Chris asks is, Wax, what happens if you are pushing away from something? You're flying through the air, as he it does to like save him. And then you drastically decrease your weight. What is the effect of that? Um, and Wax doesn't really know how to answer. It's not something he's like played around with specifically. But then later in the book, he does exactly that thing. Yeah. And the effect that it has is speeding him up. Uh, he, he gets like a boost oh, of right. speed yeah. by manipulating his weight at the same time that he is uh, steel pushing. There's yeah. something going on there, and I don't know what it is. Maybe you have some thoughts, or maybe any of the people out there, you can find us on Twitter, at Cosmere Convo, or the Reddit, Facebook, whatever. There's something going on that Brandon's been hinting at of ways that powers interact. Yeah, like how they combine. A, creating another power, not another power, but creating another ability or, or some type of... Yeah, just like the way that they can use two powers together for a result that they couldn't get separately. Exactly. Basically. Yes. It kind of creates like a third ability. Yeah, and when we start talking about the magic system on... Rishar will actually be able to dive into this uh, in a lot of depth because they have the different orders of the Knights Radiance that share yeah, powers. They but have two surges. Exactly. And each of the combinations. combinations might produce a specific tertiary effect or yeah. a tertiary ability. I would expect so. So Wax has this dance with Chris when she's asking him scientific question. Uh, and she also says something unique about the history of Scadrio. The concept that, uh, or the idea, that Wax is one of only three people born in history with, with that specific combination. combination. Exactly. And he's by far the most famous one of any of the three. Oh, that's right. Because she's like, I had to get here to talk to you. Like, do you realize how special you are? Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> Which I thought was really cool. She sees him as a subject. Yeah. yeah. From our perspective as the reader, he's the main character. Yeah. And she's like, uh, look, you're important to study scientifically. <laughs> sort of off the grid a little bit, we see what we believe is Chris and Nas in one of the broadsheet ads um, in also Mistborn Era 2. And those broadsheets, guys, if you haven't been reading those broadsheets, like, super carefully, do. Because there's so much information in them. Not only is there so much information, there's a lot of foreshadowing in Yes! There, there is actually a, a picture of of the masked individual yes! from the southern uh, tribe. We're going to get into that. Yeah, absolutely we are. And it's it's before, in like an entire book or two before they ever show up in the flesh. Like, yep. it is amazing. And I know I struggle with it uh, personally because I read uh, primarily on the Kindle. It's real hard on the Kindle. If you have the Kindle version, there's really good graphic versions um, online. And I would highly suggest you yeah. look at those. Highly suggest. Um, so in one of those broadsheets, we have an ad um, that is signed K and N. So we believe it's from Chris and Nas. And the ad is basically looking for people who hear their metal tools talking to them. So the ad is like, hey, have you heard your metal tools talking to you? If so, contact K and N. Now... What do you think that is? Because I don't know. There's only other one Ooh, metal thing think, that talks. I was going to say. Do you think they're looking for Nightblood? I'm not 100% sure. I'm not either. Or is it some kind of other like magic that's starting to come into being on Skadriel with all of this other magic trail? floating around? I don't know. I, really I mean, have obviously, no idea. metal is invested on Skadriel. That's true. Similar so, to souls. Yeah. So I I don't know maybe there's something something brewing but I just thought that was really interesting. 
Absolutely. I mean, just the idea of metal talking, like, sh- what? sends up the night blood yeah. <laughs> signal. But it's like the bat signal, the night blood signal. Exactly, just a sword. Um, <laughs> it just says evil. <laughs> the night blood is drawn toward it. <laughs> The companion that she travels with, Nas, uh, he is performing some significant works on her behalf, and I kind of see them in this relationship as a uh, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark type of thing. <laughs> like, they each have specific skill sets. Yeah, Nas definitely. Nas is an artist. Nas yes. is sketching things. And Nas, I feel like, flew under the radar a little bit more. I'm still picking up references to him in Words of Radiance, and I'm like, oh, dang! There you are, little Nas, I see you. <laughs> but there's a few sketches in Words of Radiance that are by Nas, which I'm always used to them being by Shalon, so I didn't even, like, look. But if there's a couple, if you actually look at them, the notes are signed Nas. Um, so he is out and about around the Cosmere looking at uh, different customs, clothing, um, behaviors, animals, flora and fauna, drawing and sending notes back to Chris. One of the things that he does take note of and, and draw specifically are the glyphs that Bridge 4 designs and uses. So I do not remember a specific instance when there's like an artist drawing their glyphs. There is. But there is, isn't yes. there? Yes, that's yeah. Nas. So they, they get, they, you go through the whole chapter where they get their glyphs, and then immediately after, in between chapters, is the picture of them. Got it. So as a reader, you're just like, oh, cool, cool. okay, now that's I know what, what they it looks like. like. And there's a tiny little script at the bottom that's like, this is what their glyphs look like, like, this is what each of them means, and, like, you had no idea how long I had to sit around and watch these stupid bridgemen, like, decide what they wanted to do just to get this drawing for you. So Nas has been in the background of, like, Bridge Four's story. Yeah, and you actually see him, I just picked this up, again, I'm in the middle of a Words of Radiance reread, so fresh. Um, there's a very tiny little part where all of the bridgemen are around one of their pots of stew, mm-hmm. and Kaladin spies out of the corner of his eye Rock ushering away an ardent with, like, paper and pen. Got it. He's That's the Nas. Ardent. Yes, nice. posing as an ardent, trying to, like, get into the bridgemen. <laughs> Amazing. I love it. I love the little things. Probably a single It's literally, line. yeah, like, not even a sentence. It's, like, half of a sentence. It's brilliant. I know. Thank you, Brandon. <laughs> Thank you, Brandon. <laughs> All right, let's talk about one of the most interesting aspects of the 17th Shard. There's a city. There's yes. a city that's kind of like a centerpiece or a focal point. And this is new knowledge that we have from Arcanum Unbounded. So Brandon had referenced several times that there was sort of a gathering place for these world hoppers, something like a quote-unquote restaurant at the end of the world, and then in Arcanum Unbounded, he named it as Silverlight. Silverlight is home to several different universities, or is it like one university with different colleges? No, I think there are several different universities. Are they competing universities? I I don't know. Well, because Silverlight is in the cognitive realm. Is this, this is correct, right? Yeah, yeah, which is so interesting. has some type of physical location, as all things do, in the cognitive realm. You would think. But it's primarily existing in the cognitive realm. Yes, correct. So we have so many different aspects we could look at, but this city, Silverlight, has a bunch of universities. People meet there, they study there, and it's all happening in the cognitive realm. Yeah, which is fitting. If you think about it, all these people doing knowledge-y, cognitive-y stuff are in the cognitive realm. Um, but we know that that's the residing place of Chris, Nas, and then their celestial map maker, uh, Gain. Gain. That's how I'm going to sure. say it. Yeah. Um, and we suspect that it is also a meeting place for people like the 17th Shard, other possible world hoppers that are uh, Cosmere aware. Yeah, and so just to draw a distinction, because we're throwing around these terms kind of back and forth. Oh, yeah. Good call. We do have the world hoppers, which is just anyone who has the ability for a brief period or a long-term period 
to travel between worlds. Yeah. That can be... That is a lar- the largest number. Yeah, that's numbers. the umbrella. Yes. Then we have the 17th Shard. The 17th Shard is an organization... Seems to be a specific group. We don't really know what their purpose is. We don't really know everyone that's involved. But we do know those three members that we mentioned at the beginning have been absolutely named 17th Shard. And Hoyd, in his letter, references uh, to who he is writing to, yeah, that it's your friends. So right. we believe that the recipient of letter one, author of letter two, which might be the Dragon Frost, is somehow also connected to the 17th Shard. Yep. So we could guess by the words of the second letter that the 17th Shard is an organization of world hoppers that value non-interventionism? Ooh, Something yeah, like that? I think that. that's like a fair leap to make, sure. for sure. Um, and then we have Chris and her scholar friends. Yeah. They might hang out with the members of the 17th Shard. Yeah. They definitely know about members of the 17th Shard. Yeah. But they don't seem to be doing the same thing. Right. Because 17th Shard is looking for Hoyd, possibly to make him stop intervening. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Chris seems to be avoiding Hoyd. So, yeah, I would say opposing um, motives there. Exactly. Now, with this place that is Silverlight, there are actually people that are born in Silverlight. I mean, it's a fully functioning city. Imagine it yeah. as, as a full functioning city. So, people are born, people die in the cognitive realm only? I guess. Okay, this yeah. is... Yeah. Have we had any type of information about Silverlight being a real physical city as well? No. It's got The have... only knowledge we have is that Silverlight... Is, is a city, yeah, that's based in the cognitive realm. So if it does have a presence in the physical realm, it would be lesser yes. than its presence in the cognitive realm. It's like a spren. Yeah. Magnificent in the cognitive, wisp in the yep. physical. So we have, and this is tying into a little bit of threnody as well, and the idea of cognitive shadows Ooh, yeah. being... We need like a whole episode on cognitive shadows. <laughs> We need a a whole episode on a whole bunch of things. I know. The idea being that cognitive shadows might be a lot more and seem to be a lot more than what we have experienced so far. Basically, Mm -hmm. our cognitive shadow knowledge, what we know about cognitive shadows, only comes from Mistborn's secret history. Um, I mean, Mistborn's secret history and Shadows for Silence. Yes. Yeah. So we have... Uh, really just kind of scratch the surface of yeah. what is possible. But if there are humans that are born in Silverlight, which as far as we know is cognitive realm only, then they are experiencing their entire life as a cognitive shadow, correct? You, I don't know if that's correct. I don't know. Because, well... I can explain. We need to go to the next, uh, our next little category here, though. That's fine. Okay, cool. So, we already kind of talked about how World Hoppers is the umbrella term for anyone that can uh, move between the worlds. So, ways of doing this, either they can do sort of the traditional voyage into space on some kind of space craft probably sure. with like allomancium fruit me yeah i mean see. the same way that we can send a, a, a satellite man to the moon oh, man to the moon a satellite to mars uh, i was gonna give a shout out to cassini saturn nice work there kiddo uh rest in peace on, on saturn <laughs> uh well not in peace yeah i think you were obliterated in pieces. <laughs> yeah i don't even think you're a thing anymore i think you just turned into dust but you sent back some magnificent pictures cassini Rovers, yeah, they all just travel. Kind of, sort of, as we would think of them, spacecraft. Exactly. Um, or we also know that the Elantrians can travel through space via Aeon Door. And that is the magic system Yep. on their planet. But you're still saying travel through physical space? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so their, their form of magic, yes, they can travel... Through space, but they are still traveling through physical realm space. Just wanted to make sure that was clear. Yep, absolutely. And then the second way to travel between worlds would be, as we talked about in our previous episode, moving through the cognitive realm. And that one is the one that we're right now 
kind of more familiar with, or at least is yeah. more often. But in the future, hint, hint, physical realm travel is going to become... More popular. Way more popular. <laughs> because what we see at the end of Mistborn Era 2, what is hinted at with the ability of the Aeon Door, is that you can harness the Alimantic or Aeon Door power, magic power, and turn that into a machine mm-hmm. that is basically a spacecraft. Yeah. They've already done this... Uh, With aircraft. Aircrafts in... Basically, probably the best way to think about it is like a, a helium... Mm. What's it called? Zeppelin uh, that were popular in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And they basically managed that type of creation in Mistborn Era 2 with the people from the Southern uh, civilization. Yeah. Okay. So great segue. I'm really just going to dive in deep here. That's what we're here for. (laughs) But in Words of Radiance, Shalon meets Ayatil, who is the character who's a part of the Ghost Bloods and sort of the guy who appears to be the leader of that cell of the ghost bloods Mraz, um says that Ayatil is his master sort of and he is apprentice to her she appears to be ethnically from southern scadrial so she has that like red carapace mask that they wear and but uh Brandon has also said that she is from Silverlight. So although she's ethnically Southern Sc- Southern Scadrian, mm-hmm. she was born in Silverlight. Interesting. So she does have like a physical body that she's like moving around the world in. Yes, abs- she's yeah. not only a cognitive shadow. Right. But maybe like again, we don't really know what's going on in Silverlight. For sure. Maybe I mean, there's so much we could dive into. Yeah. Just for a brief... Speculation A abounds. brief speculation. We need, like, a warning. Speculation incoming. Speculation, yeah. There are ways that we know about and characters that have gone from being cognitive realm only to back in the physical realm. The way that you do that is through hemology. Ooh. What if that's the way that silver light uh, people are born become in physical... That's interesting. They have to go through a hemallergic process. Ooh. Because that's the only or way... Or something similar. Some Yeah, some other type of similar process. But with hemallergy becoming more and more significant, mm-hmm. uh, we know that that technology, magic system, however you want to describe it, is spreading throughout the Cosmere. Oh, yeah. And there are elements of hemallergy in... The shard blades, um, as well, not in the exact same way, but definitely something like bonding and changing your spirit web. Mm-hmm. So, I have no idea, but this concept of silver light and people being born in silver light are they born with a physical body? And she was always like her mind was in silver light, but her body was in southern uh, Scadrial. I really don't know. It's one of those things that we're, like, on the cusp of figuring out. Yeah, because like we said, Silverlight's a very new discovery for us as Cosmere fans. We've only just begun to uncover that. Um, I'm sorry I interrupted for the speculation incoming, but tell us more about Ayatil and Marais. Yeah, um, so Ayatil appears to be a southern Scadrian. She has that weird mask. Um, she is known to be um, of a higher status within the ghost bloods than we initially might think because she's pretty quiet. Um, but there's also, as you mentioned, in one of the broadsheets on uh, Scadrial, there is a brief little article about, I think it's like a noble woman who mm-hmm. is traveling and she comes across a pool um, <laughs> in the middle of nowhere, which we you know, know there are shard pools. And there's this creature kneeling by the pool with this mask on. And, of course, the noble woman is like, oh, my God, I'm so afraid, and <laughs> runs away and tells the story to the newspaper. Um, but it, it could be that that person is Ayatel, yes. uh, world-hopping through that shard pool. 
So we've definitely seen her on Rashar yep. uh, as part of the Ghost Bloods. And we've possibly seen her on Scadrial. Yeah. Ethnically, though, we know that she is Southern Scadrian. Yeah. That's Border Brandon. Yep. Excellent. Just wanted to clear that up. What about her uh, apprentice, who for a little while we believe is actually in charge of the Ghost Bloods? Yeah. Marais. Yeah, Marais. Such an interesting character. I just read this part in Words of Radiance. Um, and something that struck me when I was reading it is that the first thing Shallan thinks when she sees him is that he reminds her of Hoyd. And I don't know, I don't think he actually is Hoyd, but that sort of quality where he kind of stands out doesn't seem to exactly, I don't know, feel right, you know, um, sort of indicates to me that he is definitely a world hopper. And then there are other things to back that up as well. Yeah. And I think just that mention and reference of Hoyd is definitely intentional. It's not accidental of just like, oh, he kind of looks like that dude Hoyd. No, it, we're talking about Hoyd, it's Cosmere important. Well, and Hoyd was a character that Shallan met, like, three years ago at this point. So, like, She's it had to have really, callback. yeah, it really struck her to remind her of, you know, that person from so long ago. I think that, I don't think it's Hoyd, but I do think that it's possible that Marais is like Hoyd, uh, a character with a long backstory mm. um, that it could possibly involve you know multiple lifetimes for what we consider normal humans. Yeah. And so I would imagine that one of the weird things about Hoyd is that part of what people are picking up about him is that he's literally not from their time. Like, he's yeah. much, much older yeah. than all of them. And he's, he's seen so much, and he has so much experience and knowledge. And that, you know, that would happen. That happens when, like, I see, like, super old people, and I just look right. in their eyes, and I'm like, wow, you, like, they have so many watched World War II happen or something. <laughs> yeah. uh, I watched it on Saving Private Ryan, and you watched <laughs> it actually happen. Like, it's just, it's a weirder thing when you, like, um, can kind of feel that experience, that age, that wisdom. And if you multiply that by oh, right. hundreds or thousands of years, yeah. um, then it becomes a compounded effect. So maybe that is what she's hinting at is that Hoyd maybe is the most extreme, you know, super, yeah. super old, but Marais might have a unnaturally long life that's making him feel yeah. out of place. I mean, I think all of these world hoppers, you have to kind of assume that they're all probably older than they should be because mm -hmm. like Hoyd, they can move through time, I think, right? Or is that specific to Hoyd? Well, I think Hoyd's specific ability of time dilation is closer... Is just his. Is just okay. his. And it's more like something that um, an Alamancer, or excuse me, a... Uh, yeah. Farukamis can do, like, Wayne. Right. Uh, with, with his time bubbles. Yes, bubble. exactly. So I think it's closer to that, but I definitely agree that the world hoppers, probably we should assume there's m more than meets the eye. Yeah, because I wonder, do we know if time in the cognitive realm, like, runs the same way? We have no idea. Yeah, because I'm thinking, like, if you just go to the cognitive realm and hang out for you could be what you think is that. five minutes, yeah, when you come back, oh, yeah. maybe it's one of those weird things Another where actually five thing. years have passed. Yeah. Yeah, so they could, you know, sort of have that Wasn't well. that the storyline in Inception is that you, you dream yes. for eight hours, yeah. but... If you go deeper into the levels, the time you dilation You think it's been slips. like five minutes, yeah, and then it's... Yeah, so you've actually been asleep for something like five minutes, but you experience 50 years. Yeah. So maybe that's what's happening in the cognitive realm, yeah. is that they, they are getting, you know, aged and wisdom, but it's because they spend so much time in the cognitive realm, not because their physical body actually gets mm, that much older. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good call. Um, but, okay, so for Mraze, and we don't know his real name, that's what he tells Shalon to call him as, like, a title, um, and she specifically says that it's, like, a hard word for her to say. It's not, um, Alethi or Vorin at all. Um, so while she's in his little hideout, she sees this cabinet of artifacts, 
and they seem to all be magically significant items from other planets. Some things I recognized, well, recognized is loose but it seems to be um, specific things from other worlds. Some things I have no idea, but let's just read this out. She sees a vial of pale sand, which, like, hello, white sand. Nice. <laughs> a couple of thick hairpins, a lock of golden hair. Could be the royal locks? Could be. I, I mean, hair specifically we've seen be important in the royal locks, so I would yeah. assume that is uh, part from of... From yeah. Warbreaker, Yeah. Um, the branch of a tree with writing on it she couldn't read. A silver knife, I was thinking, could be from, uh, Shadows for Silence, where silver is invested in importance. Uh, an odd flower preserved in some kind of solution. What I thought there was possibly the Tears of Edgley from, uh, Warbreaker also. Describe again what the, the tears are. Yeah, it's supposed to be kind of the origin of their color magic. Mm -hmm. And I think we know for sure that it's from their shard. It's like the physical body of their shard yes. on uh, their planet. And it manifests itself as a flower. So s Where many of the shards... dye comes from. Yeah. We, many of the shards are going to physically be represented as a stone or uh, a piece of metal. Um, yep. But it, it's possible that the Tears of Edgley are is manifesting as a flower yeah to go along with the color theme yep so that's what i thought there and, and then the last had it. <laughs> the last thing i on that's on this little shelf of artifacts is uh, a chunk of pale pink crystal that looked like it might be some kind of gemstone but why was it so delicate bits of it flaked off in its case and I don't know what that is, but I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of Beauty and the Beast with the flower yeah. in the case, uh -huh. but then it keeps dying and so pieces <laughs> yeah. are falling off. That's what I imagine. You have this this glass case with a, a pink gemstone or crystal inside, but it's flaking and pieces are falling off of it. Yeah, and Hoyd says something about a gemstone in one of the letters, yes. right? So, I mean, maybe, maybe not. Like, that could totally be a reach, but... Just something to think about. Absolutely. But I think that's pretty solid evidence that Mraze is, is a, a world, world hopper. hopper. Yeah. I agree. And let's go through some of the other world hoppers. Some yeah. we've mentioned briefly um, and some we have entire episodes about. For example, <laughs> number one on the list of war world hoppers is Hoyd. Yep, we've got Hoyd, we've got Galadon, Demu, and um, Bound, obviously. That's the trio from the 17th Shard that were hunting Hoyd at the Pure Lake. Yep. Then we have Chris and Nas, yep. scholar team. As well as, we now know their celestial map maker, Gain. Excellent. Who is producing the maps that can be found in the Arcanum Unbounded. Yeah, which are fantastic. Really beautiful maps and also part of the artwork for this show, Cosmere Conversations. So yes, Thanks, true. Gein. And, and real person in real life who is Gein. Yes. <laughs> you are, you're nice. <laughs> but fictionally, Gein is who we will thank. And then we have a group of people from Nalthus who are world toppers. Do you want to talk about them? I do, because... Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, man. All right. Let's start with the three humans that we know of. Good call. Beginning with Vasher. Vasher is someone we first meet in the book Warbreaker. He is portrayed as one of the antagonists originally. He is hunting and attempting to kidnap, possibly kill, uh, the princess, Siri. No, I'm sorry. Uh, Vivenna. Princess Vivenna. And eventually we come to realize that Vasher is much more interested in doing the right thing than doing the wrong thing. Even if he doesn't play it quite uh, as like, I'm a hero. He yeah, he's not quite a lovable character, but we end up seeing him more as... A good guy um, and he has we find out that he has a lot of different names and a really deep backstory well let's come back to the backstory after I introduce the other yeah, two members uh, of the, this human uh, group of world hoppers because 
Denth is also who we meet in Warbreaker, and he has the exact opposite story. He's introduced as someone who's helping Princess Vivenna and seems to be on the, the side of good, you know, helping out her main character, and eventually betrays her. Oh, man, he's so bad. <laughs> oh, that um, that reversal just, like, killed me when I read it for the first time. And it's a good setup, too. It's not it's something... It's so... It's well-written. It's not something that happens in, like, 50 pages of reversal. No, you spend a good half maybe even more of the book, thinking that Denth is the good guy and Vasher's the bad guy, and then the roles reverse. And Denth and Vasher uh, hate each other, and they hate have been hunting and fighting each other for what we eventually figure out is uh, many centuries. And this play with the Princess Ciri and the Princess Vivenna is just a long, the end of a long line of uh, hunting and back and forth between these two men. The reason that they are so angry and antagonistic towards one another is because of the third character. Shashara. Shashara is the sister of Denth. Yes. And the wife of Vasher. There we go. So we have the love triangle that's not a love triangle, that's a family triangle. Yeah, I mean, should we yeah, tell r- it all. really just spoil it? Yeah, yeah so, I mean, <laughs> We've hashtag already, all yeah. spoilers. This whole show is spoilers whatsoever. You're here because you love it. Yeah, so all three of them were a part of, I think it was six, right? Five. Five. Scholars, the five scholars. Five scholars. Um who I think are all returned on Nalthus and they're looking for new ways to use their magic and Shashara and Vasher come up with this groundbreaking thing. Shashara wants to tell the world about it. Vasher doesn't think it's a good idea. So he kills her. And so obviously Denth is pissed because his sister is dead. (laughs) Yes. And the thing that Shashara and Vasher stumbled upon is... The ability to take their form of investiture, which is breath, uh, each person having one breath on their world, they can voluntarily give it up so that other people can store large amounts of breath and use that as magic. The thing that they figure out is that they can take a large number of breath. I I believe it's a thousand. It's a lot. Uh, It might even be 10,000. Yeah, I think it's more than that. Okay, so... They have a large amount of breaths. Think of this almost like souls yeah, from exactly. humans. Uh, and they are going to take all of those thousand breaths and put them into a single metallic object. Metal- and their goal, their, so their goal is to give sentience to an inanimate object. They no- want to figure out how to do that with their magic system. Exactly. And normally, the closer... Uh, uh, an, yeah, the closer something is to, like, a humanoid yes. form, the easier it is to uh, animate. Yes. So, like, if you take your jacket and, you know, like, a piece of clothing is more likely to, because it's already in the form of a body, sort of. You can make a humanistic thing out of, like, straw and make it move around because it looks like a human. And the actual physical material of straw or, or cotton yeah, fibers. Yeah, something whatever. organic. Yes, it's much easier and takes less breaths to animate. Yes. The further something away from humanoid is, or the yeah, less... Yeah, and away from organic. Yes, the harder. the harder it is. So, obviously with those constraints, something that would be incredibly hard to invest using breaths would be a metal sword yeah has nothing well i mean very far away from being purely organic is not in any way the shape of a human human (laughs) but this is exactly what vasher and chashara figure out how to do how to invest a sword with a sentience through breath yeah and their magic system is also constrained by the fact that the thing that they animate has to have a command does and they in all of their you know well-meaning sort of wisdom decide hey we're gonna create a weapon that's going to destroy evil it's gonna be like this hero of a weapon right and just like be a force for good in the world 
and they didn't realize that a sword doesn't know what evil is. <laughs> it's not... I think that what they didn't recognize, other than just the <laughs> linguistic problem of, like, how do you define evil if you don't have anything else, is that they were able to give a sword sentience. Yeah. But what they could not give or impart on that sword is sapience is right yeah the great distinction idea of kind of context of a of a universality of an understanding that you as a sapient creature are kind of connected to everything else around you. Yeah, like the way humans learn, we're so dependent on our surroundings. That's so much of how we learn. And especially such an abstract concept like good and evil is absolutely something we learn as we go through our lives. But this sword has no way of learning that. And to be fair, the sword does try. He does try. <laughs> because let's just name the sword because this is what we want to talk about. Yes. Anyways. We have this sentient sword that is created by Vasher and Shashara. Eventually, Vasher is going to kill Shashara to make sure that it can never be done again. And Denth is eventually going to hate them and hunt Vasher forever because the sword they have created to destroy evil is named Nightblood. Remember that name, kids. Nightblood is everywhere. If it's not everywhere, it will be everywhere. I mean, yeah, he's not everywhere, but he is significant and uh notable notable one because he's a talking sword <laughs> <laughs> but i think nightblood too brandon does a great job of writing him because he has a very specific voice <laughs> absolutely it's not like a um any other character it's very distinct yeah. when he drops a single line at the end <laughs> well, of well that's Words a distinctive line i know but it's so good it's you're so good. just like oh shit nightblood's in the oh house oh my god i like died <laughs> So we have Nightblood. Nightblood is a sentient character. We are going to label Nightblood a world hopper. Yep. Nightblood does not understand gender, but Vasher gave him the gender of male. Yeah. So he often refers or is referred to as male, but he doesn't understand what gender is. He, it's a part of his studies uh, <laughs> is to figure out what gender is. Nightblood is a doozy. We could just do... An entire yeah there's episode. so many questions about nightblood in the way he ties into world hopping well i would say first it's been confirmed that what the group of five scholars were trying to do in creating nightblood was at least in part mimic the shard blades on rashar yes yeah, so they had knowledge of the shard blades on rashar and yep. were trying to so they were already world hoppers yep. or, and i believe they might have been more cognitive world hoppers than I would physical. I guess so, yeah. Because I think that um, they hadn't visited Rashar before they made Nightblood, but now we know that one of the places that Vasher is residing currently is on Rashar, and he's acting as the sword master for... Zahel. Yeah, Zahel uh, in Dalinar's army is the... Um, master swordsman and trains uh not only kaladin in the yeah. use of shard blade but also uh renarin and adolin adolin all get training from vasher vasher as zahil on rashar does not have night blood he doesn't oh man and there's such a great little tiny moment in that book where when we're first seeing Zahel, he is like rolling into his cot to go to sleep and it says something like, he always expected to hear a voice in his mind as he fell asleep, but there wasn't one and mm -hmm. there hadn't been in years. Which he had spent literally centuries Lifetimes, yeah, yeah. with Nightblood yeah. talking to him in his mind kind of uh, telepathically and Nightblood, I don't think by himself, again, by itself, by himself, whatever, um, I don't think by himself world hopped to Rashar. No, I definitely think he was brought there by Vasher. You, I, I almost think that something happens after Warbreaker 
where Nightblood oh, is like stolen. Oh, he, loses yeah. Nightblood? I think that someone oh, comes and takes Nightblood. Oh, that would be interesting. Nightblood. And then he comes to Rashar to look for him? Exactly. Because we know that eventually Nightblood ends up with... Nalan. And can you explain briefly <sighs> Nalan? Yeah. Nalan is the Herald of Justice mm-hmm. in the Risharan mythology. And ten... we're going to do an episode on Risharan mythology. Yes. Uh, ten heralds, each with a different kind of attribute that they mm-hmm. uh, preside over. Thank you, sort preside of. Yeah. over. So Nalan is in charge of justice. He wields the long arm of the law. And in this case, in the form of Nightblood. And he bestows The worst thing that could possibly happen. (laughs) He bestows... Nalan, the herald, bestows Nightblood to Zeth after resurrecting him. Yep. Now, this happens at the end of Words of Radiance. One of the... The assassin in white, one of the most significant characters in Way of Kings and Word of Radiance is given, to the best of our knowledge, maybe you could compare it to a shard blade, but I wouldn't. I would compare it to an um, a spren blade, uh, you know, a sill blade. Ooh, um, yeah, that's a great way to think about it, for sure. Just very briefly, shard blades are deceased spren that are um, can be passed to anyone if you kill a shard blade owner you take his shard blade and the spren blades are specific to the radiance that have bonded with that spren. yeah i mean i think just the thing to know is that they are alive and not dead yes and that's what i mean so yeah so night blood is alive uh, an alive sword <laughs> yes he you wouldn't call it a spren right but it's definitely uh, similar uh, yes and so... Except that Nightblood is more constrained. I mean... Yes. And maybe... Who knows how Nightblood has changed on Rashar, right? We don't know. Maybe he's on a different planet. Like, do the same rules of magic apply? Does he only have to follow that one command still because it's a part of his spirit web? Mm-hmm. Or is he given some kind of freedom? One of the things that we do know from Edge Dancer, uh, because Lyft, the main character there, does... Uh, see mm. Zeth, and he is carrying Nightblood in his traditional uh, sheath. So we can definitely probably assume that Nightblood does not rival the powers of Shardblades in that he's able to disappear and reappear right. into a puff of smoke. Yeah. So he's still being carried around, and I would assume... Until we get more knowledge from Oathbringer or, or future books, I'm going to assume that Nightblood is operating almost assume. identical. Yeah, that's what I would assume, too, because, of course, the way we identify him is the fact that he says, Hello, would you like to destroy some evil today? And the answer for Zeth is, of course, yes. yes. <laughs> because, oh man, w- next week we're going to go into mythology and magic on Rashar, so we'll talk more about yeah. the powers of Zeth and the, the powers... Uh, that are bestowed upon him, but with Nightblood, we have a character that has somehow been brought from Nalthus to Rashar. Vasher has followed for some reason. We don't know what's going to happen when Vasher figures out that Nightblood is with Zeth. We don't know yeah. if Vasher's going to go all ham and become, like, the near-godlike well, power that he oh, is. Oh, yeah, I guess he does have a lot of power. I mean, he is literally in Warbreaker. The god king yeah. kneels down to Vasher when he yeah. finds out his tr- his, uh, his well, real power. Well, because Vasher is, like, the father of the yes. god king. The whole reason the god king is the god king is because Vasher gave him all of his breath. Yes. So that he could, like, live a normal life. <laughs> A, a, yes, a somewhat normal life yeah. of not carrying around ten thousand breaths. Yeah. The let's so we're gonna jump back into our world hoppers. I know we got distracted by the. Yeah, I mean that's like a good group of world hoppers, though. Good to know about. Um, we have a couple more sort of lesser world hoppers that we don't see too much of, but we know they're there, and it kind of just gives you a good idea of the fact that there there is a pretty significant number of people hopping around the world. Um, we have somebody named Felt 
who is seen as a spy for House Venture on Scadriel in Mistborn 1. I don't think he's in Mistborn 2. And then also also as an Alethi scout on Rashar, um, as well as a, a Terrace woman who is seen in the very beginning of Warbreaker as the nurse tending to uh, Lemex before he dies uh, at Vivenna's side. And we can pick up on Terrace specifically because of the intricate robes that they wear and also their kind of ethnic features. Yeah. It's, it's pretty well assured that she is of Terrace background, right? Yeah, it's been confirmed by Brandon Excellent. and it was like a pretty difficult pull that a fan made and was like, hey, is this a Terrace woman? And Brandon was like, wow. Surprised you caught that. Yeah. But I would say it's like kind of their demeanor Mm -hmm. too um, sort of tips you off. Then we have the Chandra. Uh, We don't actually know how many of the Chandra are world hoppers, but we do know that the many names that they go by, the Faceless Immortals, the servants of the Lord Ruler in Mistborn Era 1, the Chandra are definitely cosmically aware yeah and they're some, around yeah some unknown number of them have world hopped with the uh end of mistborn era one rise of harmony and, and era two i am gonna specifically specifically uh call out ten soon as a possible conjure world hopper yeah for sure um just because he is so significant and has had this long relationship and personal relationship with yeah. zay's now harmony i think that he's a pretty good candidate but we we do know that conjure are around and that they are basically impossible to detect in right. the traditional ways exactly because they can become anybody yeah and then the Irie. The Irie from Mistborn Secret History. Yeah. These are a weird group of people. They um, are expatriates from Elantris, yes. which I think we mentioned previously. And they currently reside in a little castle kingdom type thing inside the cognitive realm. So similar to Silverlight, they have this cognitive city built. Yes. And the city is basically an island in the middle of the ocean on Scadriel. Kelsier talks about walking there for several weeks, uh, maybe even months, where he is walking across water and then comes upon uh, this kind of castle fortress. Yeah, it's in the far reaches. And the Iri have some unique things going on. One, they're worried about people from Threnody coming in. So I don't know if that's uh, members of the 17th Shard or, or just other world hoppers. Yeah, because we have confirmation from Brandon that Nas is originally from Threnody, but that's just one character. Yeah, and they made it sound like there was kind of a rising tide yeah. of Threnody people. Threnodites? Yes, Threnodites, <laughs> trying, to, uh, trying to block some of their work because what their work was and what Kelsier steals, as thieves are one to do, is a device that allows for some type of merge between the physical, cognitive, and spiritual realms. And the Irie is hoping to, at the death of the Shard Preservation, to take upon the spiritual power and force that spiritual power into a new vessel one of the Irie, the leader right. of the Yeah, Irie. they want to be able to influence the Ascension. Exactly. And instead, Kelsier steals that object and is going to uh, use it to ascend himself to hold preservation and possibly to allow Vin to ascend as well. I can't remember if he uses it twice or just once. I'm blanking on that. Uh, I don't know. At the you moment. read it more recently yeah, than me. Yeah, and I did, and I'm not being able to pull it at this <laughs> moment. But he definitely uses it um, to take the power uh, for himself and may use the device again to help Vin. I'll double check that, or you can hit us up on the Twitters and Reddit. So we have the Irie. What is their uh, kind of connection to Elantris? How do we know? Yeah, so this is a great example of 
uh, linguistics, allowing you to identify people from other places. Um, Irie is an aeon from the language um, in and around Elantris. And the Aeon Irie means age or time. Okay. So I thought that was interesting. It yeah. might give us some more hints about what sort of the motive of that group of people is later on down the line. To ascend through time or to defeat Who age knows? or something. Yeah. To be a hero of ages. <laughs> That's all the world hoppers that we know of. We have yeah. these characters from just about every single planet, just about every single book, who are hopping around, influencing, waiting, mm -hmm. hunting, exploring, researching. Ooh, can I drop one more yes. in here that I just thought of? Um, if you have read the short story Sixth of the Dusk, Mm -hmm. This is one of my favorite instances. Uh, this planet has a relationship with these people that they call the ones above. And they sort of see them as gods, but I think it's very clear that they're actually space-traveling people from another planet um, who leave... Well, first of all, they take things from the planet, definitely. We know that. Um, but then they also leave... Um, particular things behind. So that's another group of world hoppers that we don't know pretty much anything about, but they're there, and I think they're really interesting. What's your speculation on who the ones above are? I have some speculation. I think it, they are Scadrians, because we From know... From era yeah, four. Yeah, because we yeah. know that there's going to be a space age Mistborn, so that would be my first guess. So you think Six of Dusk happens far in the future yeah. from Scadrial mm -hmm. and Rasharian events? Yeah. Excellent. Sorry, I just had to throw that in there before we tap out. <laughs> no, that's that's a good spot to go out on. There are an incredible number of different connections that can be made throughout all of these books. We know that there are a bunch of people on Reddit and Facebook following us on Twitter who are throwing out ideas or new topics for shows please continue to yeah, do so yeah which is great that's why this is called a conversation absolutely like we want to include as many people as possible uh including someone who uh volunteered or, or donated uh some of his personal work i just wanted to give a quick shout out for our new music that we have uh introducing and outroing us for these episodes the song itself is called radiant and you can look it up on uh, youtube and we have links in the show notes it is uh, composed and created by a gentleman named david groovier david uh we hit up on twitter and he kindly uh, volunteered the song radiant uh for this podcast so we really appreciate that uh you know anybody else with questions or topic ideas or anything at all yeah. follow us and let's have a conversation about this cosmere until next time life before death strength before weakness journey before destination <laughs>